If you've got your Bible, turn it open to uh, Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 is where we'll be coming out of. We've been talking about, we've been on a series called Take a Stand. Take a Stand. And we've been talking about the armor of God. We've been talking about the armor of God, and the Bible lets us know that there's seven pieces of armor for a believer. And uh, in the text here, it lets us know that without this armor on, that we must put on, that we must put it on, that we won't be able to stand against the wiles, the strategies of the enemy, of the devil. And those, those, the, the devil's weapon is merely this, deception. But he is a formidable foe. It is not something to be taken lightly. The Bible talks about him, that he goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And why the Bible says whom he may devour? Because he can't devour or destroy everyone. But the Bible lets us clearly know that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God, to, to the pulling down of strongholds. What strongholds are, are, are strongholds in our mind. They're mental things. Many believers are sick because they think they should be sick. In other words, what I mean is, if sickness comes, I, I, I heard it this weekend. I heard, I was listening, Shanae and I were watching some YouTube videos, and we heard this song being sung, and an uh, old, old Pentecostal type song was talking about if God, if it happened, God must have allowed it to happen. And that is not a truth. That is a deception, and that is a stronghold. If cancer has entered your life, it's not because God allowed it to happen. It's because we didn't know how to defend it. God has already defeated the devil, but he, the devil uses deception. That is who he is. He is a liar. So our lives have to be rooted in truth. Truth is simply the absolute standard whereby all reality is measured. Whatever is going on in your life, you must measure it against the truth. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, he said, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. Watch this. And you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. If there's any area in your, in your life that you're not experiencing the freedom, the liberty of God, the health of God, the abundance of God, it's merely an indication that, that truth hasn't shined its light on that area of your life sickness to any degree in any level any of it and you can always measure it against the truth anything that you're, you're experiencing when jesus was here on the earth in his earthly ministry he never came up to a sick person and said oh that's my will you should have that sickness is never the will of god never now anytime is it the will of god again that has to be Sickness is measured against the truth, and Jesus came to take away sickness. That's part of our redemption. So today, that, that's a long story, but we've been talking on this series for the last few weeks, and today, uh, turn over in your Bible. We're, we're, we're going to look at this last piece, part of the armor, and uh, just quick, let's, let's read through the, through, the, uh, through the text, and you'll see all the pieces here. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6, beginning, ooh, I'm in chapter two, nine, 5. All right, finally... My brethren, Paul starts out, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Notice that verse 1, be strong in the Lord. Not in the power of your might, but be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He says, put on the whole armor of God. Good point here is that God provides this armor, but we must put it on. Why? That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Every time you see stand, circle it that you may stand against the wiles of the devil. Look at verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Your wife isn't your problem. Your husband isn't your problem. Your, your, your boss isn't your problem. Watch this. Coronavirus isn't the problem. It is the fruit of a problem. There's a deeper root. Watch this. But again, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against the uh, spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places or in the spirit realm. Therefore, because our enemy is spiritual, because the root of your problem is spiritual, the root to every fruit of a problem. If you've got a fruit of a problem, a fruit means you see it, you can touch it, you can see the problem. If the, if the problem is cancer, the root is a spiritual root. Oftentimes when we only deal with the, the problem,
problem, we're dealing with the symptoms and putting a bandage on it. We've got to get to the root. Remember when Jesus, in Mark chapter 11, he was teaching on faith, Mark chapter 11, and he, actually in, in, in the chapter prior, chapter 10, or in the earlier verses, chapter 11, Jesus spoke to a fig tree. He spoke to it. And if you read the passage, it says, on the next day when they came by, the next day they came by and the tree had dried up from the roots. God's way is always to get to the root of the problem, the root of the sickness. And, and the Bible's telling he, us here, the root of the problem, every natural problem, is a spiritual problem. Are y'all listening to me? He says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God, not a part of the armor, but the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand. Stand now, withstand in the evil day. What we're experiencing right now globally is an evil day. And having done all to Stand, third time, watch this. Stand there for fourth time. The key, the key to fighting spiritual warfare is being able to stand. Being able to stand. Watch what it says. Stand there for having. Stand having three of these pieces of armor on at all times. Stand having these on. Having girded your waist with truth. Again, truth being the first part of the armor because all the other pieces of the armor are connected to truth without truth you don't know where where the problem is amen uh having put on well, let me see stand therefore having having girded your waist with truth having put on the breastplate of righteousness having it on you've already put this on you went breastplate of righteousness and having your having feet having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The three pieces of armor that you should keep on all the time, put these on, and, you, and these are things that we, are, they're all doctrinal truths that me, we must live in. Number one was the truth. Number two was the breastplate of righteousness, right? You can see that breastplate of righteousness. All of our vital organs are protected by that, spiritually and physically. And then our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace peace walking in peace walking in the gospel peace we covered that aptly over the last few weeks look at this now watch these next three pieces of armor above all taking the shield of faith the verb here is changed taking the shield of faith and uh, with which you will uh, quench be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one covered that last week and take the other ones having on these three take Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And again, we covered those three last week. And, and with those three pieces of the armor, what you've got to understand is the, other, the first three, the, the uh, belt of truth, breastplate of righteousness, shoes of peace, you keep those on all the time. Isn't that true? Pretty much. You're going to walk around with some pants and a belt on and uh, 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 something covering your chest and something on your feet. If you're going to leave the house, that's what you do. But then, or think of it like a football game or a baseball game. You may not be carrying the bat. Pick up the bat or the helmet or these other pieces until you're actually going into the battle. And that's what he's talking about right here. Take up the helmet of salvation, covered that last week, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, right? Go to the next one. All right, good, good, verse. And now, those are the, the six pieces that we initially talked about. Today, we're going to look at the seventh piece, which is in verse 18. Amen? So let's take a look at that. By the way, if you missed any of those, go back on my, on, uh, to our website or to my Facebook page, and you can view that last week if you didn't catch those, all right? Look over Ephesians chapter 6. Let's look at it in the Amplified verse, uh, Amplified Bible, verse 18. And this, the, 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 the rest of this passage is about prayer. It is, I believe it is the seventh piece. Many, many people teach, uh, teach the armor of God as six pieces. But if you know God and you, and you know some of the systems of God, you always know that God operates in numbers like three and seven. Six is the number of man. Six is the number of man. And really, this last piece of the armor, and we'll read it and see how it's, how it's added in, completes this full armor without this seventh piece none of the other pieces work this is how you put them all on watch this um pray at all times on every occasion in every season look at it let's just break it down i'll read the whole thing then we'll break it down pray at all times on every occasion in every season 
in the spirit with all manner of prayer and entreaty to that end keep alert while you're praying with you want this result is what he's saying to that end keep alert and watch with strong purpose and perseverance interceding in behalf of all the saints God's consecrated people so verse 18 I believe is the seventh and the completed part of this armor and he starts out talking about first of all pray at all times pray at all times what let's talk about that because many people when they read these passages and there's numerous numerous passages about praying all the time let's explain that first of all let's look at a few of these passages y'all right y'all know i'm a teacher so i want you want to take you to the scriptures and show you over and over that that same type of phrase is used throughout the bible look at luke chapter 18 and verse 1 thank you back there luke chapter 18 and verse 1 then Jesus spoke a parable to them. Remember, Jesus always taught in parables. He said he spoke a parable to them that men, ought, uh, men always ought to pray and not lose heart. This is a vitally important truth. Prayer is something that all of us, and particularly men, notice this. This men, the, Jesus had 12 disciples that were around him, and they were men. Men ought to always pray. My next series, by the way, because I won't have time to, today to go into great, great detail about this and that, that verse. We're going we're gonna to outline it today, cover some key, key points in, about it. But my next series, starting next week, I've got to break this down. We've got to talk about prayer. The Bible writes says, pray at all times, praying at all times. Here he says, men ought to always pray and not, and, and not lose heart. Praying keeps you from losing heart. One translation says, and faint not. Praying, praying is, the primary purpose of praying is establishing relationship. Praying, so when the Bible here talks about praying all the time, it's talking about having a relationship and communication all the time. Shanae and I are married, and, and, and the Bible talks about our relationship with Christ being a marriage to him. We're married to Christ. We're one with Christ. We're one spirit with him. We're, we're united to him in covenant. We're one together with him in spirit. And just like my wife and I are married, and we talk all the time. Right now, at this second, I'm not talking to her. So the Bible isn't be talking about being religious, and you've got a 24-7 uh, be, be communicating with God. What it's saying is in an ongoing way, there should be this relationship. There isn't a day that goes by that I don't talk with Shanae, just at, at some, on some level. There isn't a day. It doesn't matter if she's in uh, one place and I'm in another. We're going to talk. Even if I'm out of town or she's out of town, we are going to talk on a daily basis. And you as a believer should be talking to God on a daily basis. Let's get some more scripture about that. Look at this. And particularly men. Particularly men. Look over at uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse 12. Look at this one. Rejoicing in hope patient in tribulation continuing continuing steadfastly in prayer steadfastly steadily steadfastly continuously is what that's saying let's look at another verse look over in uh, philippians chapter 4 and verse 6 very familiar passage of scripture watch this be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication let me just add this in this verse you're going to see it says don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, prayer. The way you stop anxiety, worry, concern is prayer. Don't worry or be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer. The way you don't worry about anything is to pray about everything. Y'all see it? Prayer and supplication. Supplication is is a type of prayer supplication there's a few words that the bible used for it petition entreaty and supplication all mean the same thing it means in everything pray by prayer and asking for things with thanksgiving asking god for things with thanksgiving prayer must always be with thanksgiving in fact i'd like to say and i'll show you in the scriptures and probably in the series we may not get to it all today but most of your prayer will be thanksgiving Look at what he says. In everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. When you ask for something, it's always asked with thanksgiving. 
Ooh, I can't wait to break that down. Let your requests be made known to God. Do you know that God encourages us over and over and over in the scriptures to ask, to ask, to ask. He says, anything that's according to his will, ask for it and you will receive. For everyone who asks, receives. And everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Everyone who seeks, finds. It doesn't say some, it says everyone. There's a proper way to pray, and that's what we've got to understand, how to do it so that we always receive the answers to our prayer. Look over in this one, this, this next one, Colossians chapter 4 and verse 2. Continue earnestly in prayer. Continue. That means ongoing, earnestly in prayer. Being vigilant. How? In it with what? Thanksgiving. Most of prayer should always be in thanksgiving. That tells me something about it, that what I'm asking for, God has already probably provided it. I just need to thank him for it. There's a way to do it right, and, a, and many believers are doing it wrong, which is why they're not receiving what they've asked for. Come on, go to my next verse here. Look at Thessalonians. Ooh, I love this. Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 16, I believe through 17 or 18. Rejoice always. Look at that. Pray without ceasing. In some things, you got it, in everything, give thanks. Have y'all caught something here? Hopefully you're seeing that thanksgiving and prayer go together. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Amen, amen, amen. All right, so the Bible says, let's go back to, to Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18, maybe I ought to turn to it. It says, Pray at all times, on every occasion, in every season, right? So we just found out, yes, we are supposed to pray at all times. And again, that doesn't mean 24-7 you're on your hands and your, and your knees. What it means is on an ongoing basis, you're always in communion with God, right? And there are going to be times that, you'll, you, that you should specifically get together with him and just have a conversation with him. Now, it's ongoing. Shanae and I do have times where we're, you know, I'll call, pick up the phone or text her, where we're always having ongoing communication. But there are some times that we set aside throughout the week where we're just going to sit and talk. A lot of that time is just in our private time in the bedroom before we go to bed. Or, or a lot of times there is a, well, of course, now with COVID-19, we haven't been able to go out on our regular date night. But this Friday, we just sat. We have a, a sitting area in our bedroom, and we just sat there in the chairs, turned on some music started talking you got it and just sat there and just had had conversation for hours on end just fellowshipping together just uniting our hearts together just talking just just thinking about stuff and memories and talking about stuff looking at pictures listening to music holding hands you get it just to hang out time and each of us should have those alone times those private times with God this is why every morning I'm encouraging you and particularly men you say, Pastor Stokes, I'm not on Facebook. This would be a reason to get on it. This would be the reason that I would encourage you to get on Facebook. And if there's anything in your life that is not in line with the will of God, be it an addiction, be it sin, be it a sickness, be it some, some darkness, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, this is the way to get rid of it. It's a continual time and the word of meditation which meditation is a part of prayer we may get to that today if not we're definitely going to get to it in the series we talk about it all right so we see that praying in praying at all times on every occasion in every season let's look at this next part in the spirit in the spirit let's talk about that a little bit in the spirit turn over in your bible do y'all know what praying in the spirit is praying in the spirit is praying in other tongues turn over in your bible to first corinthians chapter 2 and verse 6 through 14. Of course, I've taught lots of series on this, but as I began studying, over the, studying this over the last few weeks, it resurged and reignited a fire on the inside of me to pray in the Holy Spirit, to pray in the Holy Spirit. And, and one, of the reasons, uh, one of the reasons is it, it is a weapon. Praying in the Spirit, I used to teach that of the armor of God, there was only one uh, weapon, and it was the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But really, the word of God coming in prayer and in tongues is a weapon too. The seventh piece of armor is a weapon. It is a weapon. The prayer, 
prayer, the primary purpose of prayer is fellowship with God. But the other, the secondary and probably next most important reason for prayer is for God to get the will of God in the earth. God works the will of God in the earth through the prayers of mankind. It's God doesn't do anything in the earth without first recognizing man and, and acknowledging it with him. God always works what he does in the earth through mankind. The way God enters into your, your life is through your prayer. You invite him. God is a gentleman. He is not going to bust in your life and heal you if you aren't in alignment and, and in agreement and in partnership with that. God isn't just going to heal you and bless you if you aren't in alignment with him in prayer. Are y'all listening to me? It doesn't happen that way. And even with laying on of hands, what that is is just like a, uh, jumping a car. You can receive, you can receive healings and, and miracles and, and things from God through someone else's faith. It's just like jumping a car battery. If your car battery is dead, you may have to take the power or the connection from someone else's battery connected to yours to jump your battery. And that's essentially what laying on of hands is. But you've got to come into agreement at some level to receive the will of God in your life, the, the power of God in your life. And that's what prayer does. Prayer Prayer changes things and changes you, but it doesn't change God. Prayer, and, but praying effectively changes you and changes things, but doesn't change God. God is always consistent. He's always the same, but it's our prayers that align us and circumstances with his will. Amen, amen, amen. Um, second, first Corinthians chapter, chapter 2 and verse 6. How's my time? Praise the Lord. Watch this. However... Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, however, we speak the wisdom of God among those who are mature. The wisdom of God is always going to be the answer to every one of your problems. Paul is speaking right here some wisdom of God for problems that people are facing. He's, he's saying, we speak the wisdom of God among those who are mature. Why he said those who are mature? Because those who don't see the need for wisdom, they're, they're babies. <laughs> they're immature. If you don't have a hunger and a desire for knowledge, understanding, and wisdom, the wisdom of God, it's because you're an immature baby in the things of God. Come on, somebody. That's a hard truth. But that truth right there, if you never get into the Proverbs, on a consistent basis, you'll always never get the healing, the thing that you need. Wisdom is the answer for it. Wisdom is the answer for your sickness. Wisdom is the answer. Watch. And so he's going to show us how to get wisdom in our life here, <laughs> the wisdom of God. Let's read it. Watch this. Whoever, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. He said, we're going sh- to speak some wisdom, but it's not going to be the wisdom of the world. Watch this. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages. Circle this in your Bible if you've got it open for our glory. Keep your finger right here. Let's keep this verse. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip from this verse and look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 just for a second. Let me see. Is that right? Yeah. Chapter 14. But look, look at this verse again. Yes, yes, y'all are awesome back there. Flip back over again. Oh, uh, flip back over to the previous one. Yeah, I want y'all to see that. Yes, 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 yes. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. He said, we've got to speak the wisdom of God. Mm. If you get with me on, on the, in the mornings, what you're going to find out, out about being a believer is that God wants to pour truth on the inside of you like a container that will put roots of your life down in the, in the word of God, in the life of God, the health of God, like roots in a tree. And those roots will surge through your spirit, through your soul, and into your life. It will produce, but it takes growing just like a tree. Watch, it's wisdom from the inside that comes forth out of your mouth. The way the things of God work is that he puts it in your heart, and you speak it out of your mouth like a pitcher. 
Your mouth is the spout or the spigot to whatever's on the inside of you. And whatever's on the inside of you shows up in your life because you spoke it out. Your, your life is following your words. What the Bible is going to show us here is a secret, a secret in the script, scriptures to speaking forth the wisdom of God. Why do we have to speak forth the wisdom of God? Because we want that in our life. The wisdom of God is resident on the inside of every believer by the Spirit of God. You're, if you're born again, you've got the Spirit of God on the inside of you. Now watch this. There is a subsequent experience called the baptism of the Holy Spirit where you receive the power of God. The power, God's literal, literal power. All the power he has, you have, but it's in your spirit. Are you with me? All the wisdom of God that God has is in your spirit right now. But he says we speak the wisdom of God. In a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages. Look at these next words and highlight this in your Bible. For our glory. For our glory. You've heard me say this before, but the glory of an orange is the juice on the inside of it. The glory of an eagle is its six-foot wingspan. The glory of Luther Vandross was this. I'm not going to do it well, but remember how Luther used to do that? The, the glory of Anita Baker is that, that deep, sultry voice. Sinead and I were listening to some of her music this weekend. That it's, it's, it's the thing that God has given you to make you uniquely you. It's your glory. It's what separates you from everyone else. He said, look at that verse again. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordains before the ages for our glory. You have to speak forth your glory. The glory that God has put you in the earth to display, which glorifies him, is in your spirit right now as a born-again believer. If you're born again, it's already in you, but you have to speak it forth. Just like you have to speak forth healing, just like you have to speak forth salvation. That's how you got saved. Remember how you got saved in Romans chapter 10? If you shall believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth you shall, that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. Did y'all hear that process? Something got on the inside of you. You received Jesus, the Spirit of God. You confessed him with your mouth. Homologia. Confession means homologia. Say the same thing God says. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. God, you're the, perp you're the product of God's purpose for your life. God wants you to speak your purpose, your purpose forth. And how do you do it? In a mystery. What does that mean? Now flip over in your Bible. Keep your finger right there and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 too. Thank you all back in the back. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 2. For he who speaks in a tongue, that means in other tongues, does not speak to men, but to God. Speaking to God is called prayer. Isn't that right? He who speaks in a tongue, and this whole chapter is about praying in other tongues, speaking in other tongues, does not speak to man, but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks what? Mysteries. Ah, Remember what we said earlier, we speak forth the wisdom of God in a mystery. How do we speak forth the wisdom of God? In other tongues. When I speak in other tongues, I'm speaking forth the wisdom of God, the glory of my life. What God has created me to be, do, and have, if I don't know what it is, and even if I do know what it is, I speak it forth in other tongues. That's the reason you ought to pray in other tongues, and that's one of the reasons that it is part of the armor of God. Pray in the Spirit. Let's read on. Go back over to, uh, go back over and we'll finish up. First Corinthians. Yes, yes. Watch what it says. Which, pray, pray mysteries. It says, which none of the rulers of this age knew. They didn't know. The, the rulers of this age, government, the devil, wor the world did not know this. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Y'all hear how huge this is right here. He said, if the devil, if the rulers of the world had have known what would have happened when Christ died on the cross, they wouldn't have wanted him to die. They didn't want him to die. 
Why? Because now the spirit that is the spirit of Christ is now able to get on the inside of every person that receives him. Come on, somebody. Do y'all get the problem with that? One Jesus is a problem for hell and darkness. A whole bunch of Christians is a bigger problem, particularly if they get this, that if I pray in other tongues, I speak forth the mysteries of God, the wisdom of God, the purpose of God, the glory of God for my life. This is one of the reasons I'm preaching today and teaching when it wasn't my idea. I didn't know this was part of my life. I had no idea. And I'm telling you, if you'll commit a life to praying in other tongues, you're going to start speaking forth your future, the glory of, that God has for you, and you're going to walk into it if you'll stay consistent in that. Come on, somebody. That's enough to slam the Bible down and go on and get some chicken right there. Look over at verse 9. Watch this. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Because, but it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor it have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Listen to what he's saying. He's saying because you and I naturally can't know all that God has for us. We can't naturally know that. There's not a teacher that can tell you what God has for you. He said, because I hasn't seen nor ear heard nor has entered into the heart of, the man, of man the things that what God has prepared for those who love him. God has something prepared for you already. God has a future prepared for you. God has healing prepared for you. He's got prosperity prepared for you. He's got a career prepared for you already, but you may not know what that is. That was my position. That was my state. I didn't know what it was. Look at this. Go to the next one. But God has revealed them to us. Say to me. Say to me. That's me. How did he do it, though? Through his spirit. Watch this, y'all. For the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. Oh, my God. Proverbs. Proverbs talks about this. Proverbs chapter 16 talks about these, these deep things and how we release them with our mouth. Ooh, we're going to get to another one in Proverbs that says that. Get with me in the mornings on Proverbs. We'll talk more about this. For the spirit searches all things. Yea, the deep things of God. Look at verse 11. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him come on somebody what he's saying right there is the things you can't know what God has for you except by the spirit that's in you even so no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God next now we have received not the spirit of the world but the spirit who is from God why did we receive the Spirit from God? Here's the answer. Highlight this, underline it in your Bible. That we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. The reason you received the Spirit of God so that you might know the things that have been freely given to you by God. God has great things in store for you that you might not know about. I guarantee you, you don't know all the great things that God has for you. But he says the spirit of God that's in you does know it. Not just, this, not just your spirit, but the spirit of God in your spirit. Good God, Jesus. Look at verse 13. These things we also speak. What things we also speak? The things that God has prepared for those who love him. How do we speak them? Here it is. These things we also speak. Not in words which man's wisdom teaches... We can't speak it in our known language because we don't know it. But which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Oh, my God. That's like it just, yeah, I get so excited about that. That's so crazy right there. Listen, he said the things that God has for you, all the good things that God has for you, we speak them. How do we speak them? We don't speak them with intelligent words that some teacher told us or that we read in a book. We speak them by words that the Holy Spirit teaches us. Comparing spiritual things that, that the Holy Spirit has, God has prepared for us with the spiritual things that are in our heart. We speak them forth spirit to spirit. Come on, somebody. But the natural man, the carnal man, the natural man, 
who thinks that this stuff is stupid, that doesn't have enough time. Oh, I ain't got no time to get in the Proverbs pastor's nose. I ain't got no time for that baptism of the Holy Spirit. I ain't got no time. Are you kidding me? I work all the time. That's why you work all the time and are still broke. That's why you're not walking in your purpose and your destiny. Come on, somebody. I'm telling you the truth right here. This is why many believers are going to be shocked when they get to heaven and find out all the great things that God had for them that they never walked in because they were too busy or these were too silly things to take time to do. Come on, somebody. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. If you never spend time in the Word of God, this sounds like I'm speaking in a foreign language to you right now. The truth of the matter is these are keys that God has given us so that we can walk in everything that he has for us. Verse 14, let me see, where else? Y'all get that? Is that good news? Now, turn back over to uh, Corinthians 14. Corinthians 14, let's read that one again. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. Look at verse 4. He who speaks in, in a tongue edifies himself. Come on, y'all. Build, edifies means to build himself up, to make himself strong. He who speaks in, a, in an unknown tongue is where we get the word edifice. Edifice is simply a building, structure, strong structure. He who speaks in a, in t- in a tongue builds himself up. You're building yourself up. You're building up your future. You're speaking forth your future. But he who prophesies edifies the church. Y'all get it? Speaking in tongues edifies me. Speaking in prophecy builds up the church. And and y'all see it in this chapter. It's going to talk about speaking in an unknown tongue, someone else interpreting it in a public public setting. Like, Like I'm looking around at all these seats right now. Nobody's in them. But... There have been times, typically in our service, when someone will give a tongue and then someone will give an interpretation. And it's edif- always what makes, what, which helps validify it is if it builds up the church, builds up. When you're praying in other tongues, you're building up yourself. You're getting built up. Amen. Look at verse 14. Watch this. Ooh, I really like this one. For if I pray in a tongue... My spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. When I'm praying in unknown tongues, the Bible says I'm putting a microphone right on my spirit. My reborn, united with Christ, full of the Holy Ghost, full of power, spirit. I stick a microphone on my spirit, and, and, and it speaks the will of God through my tongue. Like this. One of the keys to one of the reasons that I'm in the ministry now is because years ago when I didn't know when I was called to the ministry, I started praying in other tongues just every day. Walking, I would walk every day and I would just walk praying in other tongues. I started this years ago as a as a born again as when I first got born again, I was 18 years old. I was in the Army National Guard, y'all. Army National Guard. And uh, I was saved, but I wasn't baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I'll have to do sessions on the baptism of the Holy Spirit when we're talking about prayer. And that's uh, in those sessions in that series, I'll talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. I was 18 years old in Army Nash, in the Army Basic Training in Fort Dix, New Jersey. And I used to, I got, I went there. I was saved, but I hadn't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But I wanted the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so when I got there, I I went to this. Actually, it was like a Catholic church service that I went to. I went to because I didn't know. I'm Fort Dix, New Jersey. is my first weekend there uh, after basic, you know, basic training is on. And I didn't know where to go to church, but I saw this building, and I was like, I went in there. I didn't know it, but it was a Catholic service. I sat in the back. The dude's up there saying stuff. I don't know what he's talking about, but I sat back in the back. Lord, I need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I sat back in that back of the building. I said, baptize me now with the Holy Spirit. And I received it by faith. Right then, in that service, in that, in that, in the back of that Catholic church in, in Fort Dix, New Jersey, terrified out of my mind, terrified about base, army basic training, terrified about being away from my home for the first time, being out on my own, having to make my mom sign me up for the army, wanted me to grow up and be a man. Thank you, mama. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 
got baptized in the Holy Spirit there, started praying in other tongues. In the back of that service, after they let us out, now every day we would do, we had to get up really early, like 4 o'clock in the morning, and we had to jog, jog miles, I mean loads of miles, maybe 5 miles every day. We would we'd run and do all these calisthenics first and then run every day. Boots on, every, you know, in, in gear it, for PT in the morning. We'd run with our boots on. And they would be saying cadences, you know what I'm talking about, like the, the, whole, the whole army platoon, and our, uh, they would be saying, the, the drill sergeant would be running next to us, and he would be saying stuff. But some of the stuff was kind of vile, real nasty kind of stuff, you know. But I didn't want to say it. I was so excited about praying in tongues that every day they would be marching, and I would be marching too, and I was a squad leader, so I was right in the front, and, and they would be saying whatever they're saying, and I would be going, Roca, Shoko, Laraduco, Maria, Estuco. I did it so much every day the whole time even when we're running we're, 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 we're running jogging you know and every day they do it and they'd be saying all this stuff you know these rhyming cadences but I would be praying in tongues so much that the drill sergeant thought that I was a foreigner I was light enough uh, that they thought I was Hispanic they said they started yelling at me one day they said because we were in New Jersey so it was, they had a lot what they called New Yorkans all in our platoon and so many of them spoke Spanish and could hardly speak English well they knew I spoke English but they thought I spoke Spanish because I prayed in tongues the whole time I was there in army basic training and really I was praying because I was so amazed at it it was amazing to me and number two because I was so freaking scared I was so scared of what you know of, of carrying a machine gun of being I was just terrified of it well the drill sergeant came up to me one day and he's right there when we're in uh, in, in formation and he's yelling at me because some of the Hispanic guys didn't understand or they couldn't do what he was saying and they thought the drill sergeant thought he didn't understand him he came up right in my face and said Strokes get over here you speak Spanish and I was like no sir I, I don't speak Spanish no sergeant I don't speak Spanish yes you do I hear you speaking Spanish every day y'all I don't know Spanish I know tongues I know other tongues me and my good friend Todd Williams when we were in when we got all of us got back from basic training he, we were in the Army National Guard in the same platoon together we would sit in there and we would be playing playing like uh, with our trays at lunchtime he was in my same company with me and we would be acting like we were talking in a language to each other but we would just be praying in tongues like we were just having fun with it we just loved being baptized in the Holy Spirit we loved the experience of it and it has changed our lives look at this Bible y'all for if I pr verse 14 1 Corinthians 14 14 for if I pray in a tongue my spirit prays but my understanding is unfruitful amen turn over to Jude we're gonna have to close look at this God my time got away from me already y'all look at Jude Jude there's only one chapter in Jude but the Jude chapter 1 verse 20 and 21 look it says but you beloved building yourselves up on your most holy faith praying in the Holy Spirit hold up keep that verse up there for a second look at that but you beloved that's the beloved us beloved building yourselves up on your most holy faith he said you build yourself up on your most holy faith how praying in the Holy Ghost look at this it's a comma after that look at the next part go to verse keeping keep yourselves in the love of God if you look at this in other translations it says when you're praying in the Holy Spirit you're keeping yourselves in the love of God the Bible says that faith worketh by love Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6 faith worketh by love by you knowing that you're loved by God causes you to have faith I know sickness can't stay on me because by his stripes by his beatings he provided health for me it causes my faith to work Jesus received my sickness I refuse to receive it he said praying in tongues build you up in your most holy faith by keeping you in the love of God have you ever felt in life at any point, wow, God doesn't love me. He must be mad at me. Praying in tongues will remind you and keep you in the love of God. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. He says it will cause you to look for the grace and mercy of God. Come on, anybody need some grace and some mercy? Need some grace for health, grace, abundance for my life? I need that. Praying in tongues is the way I lock myself into it. Come on, somebody. I'm trying to close. Look over at Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27. We're just going to cover one part of this because I'm out of time. Likewise, the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, also helps our weaknesses. One translation says infirmities. 
our weaknesses. I don't know if you're like me, but I got weaknesses. I got shortcomings. I got things I want God to work on. He says, how likewise the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. Come on, y'all. Have y'all figured that out? I don't know what I should pray for about this situation. I don't know how I should pray for my kids about this situation. I don't know how I should pray for my church about this situation. Look what he says. For we do not know what to pray for as we how to we do not, not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us. The Holy Spirit who's on the inside of you does know. So intercession here can be prayed in the Holy Spirit, right? But look at this last part, and this is what we got to get to next week. Put that back verse up there for me one more time, please. Yeah. For uh, with groanings which cannot be uttered. Groanings, I want to show you in the scriptures, and I don't have time today. Our time's out. Ah, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you that Jesus did this. Groanings is another level of praying in the spirit. Look what it says. With groanings which cannot be uttered. There is a groaning in the spirit that is perhaps a part of praying in tongues. I've groaned in the spirit before when it is... Um, Praying, if I pray in the tongues for an extended period of time, not all the time, but if I pray in tongues for an extended period of time, sometimes I'll get to the point where I don't have words but just groans. Turn over in your Bible because Jesus did this. And, and watch, what you're doing is praying for your weaknesses and infirmities. The weaknesses and infirmities. Maybe you have a weakness of sin. Maybe you have a weakness of addiction. You can overcome that. Please get this out of your mind. If you were a drug addict, don't say I'm still a drug addict. If you were an alcoholic, you're not still an alcoholic. You're a born-again believer. If you were a fornicator, you're not a fornicator and an adulterer now. You're, a, you're the righteousness of God. It's one of the things I don't like about uh, uh, AA and those things when they make you confess what you were. I get it. I get it. They don't want you ever to let go of that. But as a born-again believer, you've got a higher system that says, no, you've been renewed. You no longer have to be bound by that. Come on, somebody. Your confession will keep you locked to things. Make your confession who you are now. You are the righteousness of God. You are the free. You are the redeemed. You are the, you are the delivered. You are the blessed. You are the rich. Come on, somebody. Look at, look at Jesus, and we're going to close. We're going to close with this. All right. In John chapter 11. John chapter 11. You remember that chapter? That's the chapter where Lazarus had died. Ja uh, Martha and Mary's brother, Lazarus, had died, and Jesus showed up on the scene. Of course, Jesus showed up four days after he had died. They were mad about it, very upset. And I don't have time to read the whole chapter, but when Jesus did show up, look what it says. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, Mary weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, he did what? He groaned in the spirit and was troubled. He groaned in the spirit. The Bible says that this groaning in the spirit helps our infirmities. Jesus didn't have any infirmities as in sicknesses or weaknesses, but Lazarus did. Mary and them did. His intercession for them was groaning which came against the situation that he was facing. Look at, the, look at verse 38, last verse and we're closing. Then Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. Came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Remember, this is where Lazarus was and he told him to roll the stone away. He groaned in the spirit. There was a spiritual warfare going on that Jesus was fighting and won. Come on, are y'all listening to me? And the Bible says he groaned in the spirit and he said to Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth, wrapped up in those, wrapped up in grave clothes. And the Bible says that Jesus said, loose him and let him go. He spoke to them, to the men, to go over and unwrap him and untie him. He had already been set for a grave, mummified, and they unloosed him, and Lazarus lived. Jesus prayed and groaned in the spirit. Are y'all listening to me in this place? Good God, I, can, I stirred myself up. I'm telling you, saint of God, if you embrace this seventh piece of the arm, and I didn't finish it, we didn't get into every type of prayer and supplication and how to pray. What we're going to do is we're going to end this series here. Next week, I'm going to start it's talking, talking about the different kinds of pray, prayer and how to pray effectively. You're going to see your prayers answered. You're going to see everything that God has for you come to pass because that's his promise when we pray effectively. Let me pray for you. If you're watching today, I declare you blessed. Now, if you're watching today and you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, 
Let me say this prayer with you. If you're here today and you're watching by internet and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, friend, God's not mad at you. He's madly in love with you. And he has a great future for you. You're not just the product of your parents' passion. You really are the product of God's purpose. If you want Jesus as your Lord and Savior, say this simple prayer with me. Say this, Father, in the name of Jesus, I believe that Jesus died and rose again from the dead. Right now, you're my Savior, my Lord. Forever, I'm saved. If you said that simple prayer a minute from your heart, we believe you're born again. Why don't you let us know right there online or call our office. Let us know that you're born again. We thank you for joining us again. I want to encourage you to sow your seed. Give, if this ministry is a blessing to you, sow your tithe, sow your offering. Continue to follow us. Continue to watch us. I'm going to be right here with you tomorrow morning, 7 a.m. Meet me for prayer and proverb. I love you. God bless you. Have a great day.